Okay, uh, we're going to go ahead and get started. I'd like to thank everybody first for joining us for this week's uh, Center for Middle Eastern and North African Studies colloquium series. Um, just a note on your way out, please sign in, sign out, uh, just so we can kind of keep track of how many people we're, we're bringing in for the events. Um, and this week I'm very happy to welcome another Michigan grad, uh, Ilana Feldman, uh, who finished her PhD here in Anthro History in 2002. She's currently Professor of Anthropology, History, and International Affairs at George Washington University. Uh, Ilana has done wide-ranging ethnographic and archival research uh, that has, has kind of stemmed from the everyday politics of displacement uh, to international understandings of humanitarian concepts. Uh, her work is centered in the Middle East, in Gaza, on the Palestinian refugee camps broadly. Uh, so please join me in welcoming uh, Ilana. I just need to turn on the mic. Um, thank you very much for having me and to all of you for coming. It's, um, yeah, it's, it's delightful to be back at Michigan. Um, so, um, yeah, I, I just sort of a sort of framing note for this. I did my, my first two books were focused on Gaza, um, and I'm currently doing research um, that includes Gaza as, as one of its sites, but I'm looking at the Palestinian refugee experience is living with in relation to a humanitarian assistance apparatus since 1948. So I've been looking across the areas of UNRWA operation, Lebanon, West Bank, Jordan, Syria, and Gaza. Um, Syria and Gaza being the hardest places to do field work, but um, include, uh, I have archival research on there. But for today, just asked me to talk about the, the question of Gaza and the space of Gaza as a space of um, immobility in the context of this course where you've been hearing a lot about mobility and forms of movement. Um, so I'll sort of return to <coughs> this closer focus on Gaza. So in February 2015, the well-known British street artist Banksy went to the Gaza Strip to draw attention to the plight of Palestinians in the aftermath of the devastating Israeli assault of the previous summer. With regard to the murals he painted around the Strip, he wrote, and here are the, some of the murals, Gaza is often described as the world's largest open-air prison because no one is allowed to leave or enter. But this seems a bit unfair to prisons. They don't have their electricity and drinking water cut off randomly every day. So this comment from Banksy, um, and you can see just uh, if people haven't seen these images, I mean, part of what he's trying to do here is create a visual disturbance in a in a field of um, <clears throat> destruction. One of the things that he said about this cat image is that on the internet, people only want to look at cats. So if I put a cat in Gaza, maybe people will pay attention to it. Um, but his comment about the open air prison, which is, an, is a new iteration in a long history of describing Gaza as a place of confinement, is meant to point out the continuous degradation of living conditions in this sliver of land cut off from the rest of Palestine and the world. So plans for rebuilding Gaza in the wake of the 2014 Israeli onslaught also pr prompted a suggestion for revision in terminology. And again, just so you, you know, one, I won't show a lot of images of the destruction, but just one to give you some sense. Um, in response to the Cairo Donor Conference, held in late October 2014, commentators argued that proposals for reconstruction would in fact deepen the system of control over Palestinians and would place humanitarian actors in the position of implementing the blockade that Israel has tightened since Hamas was elected to lead the Palestinian Legislative Council in 2006. And according to the journalist Jonathan Cook, one Israeli analyst has compared the proposed solution to transforming a third world prison into a modern U.S. supermax incarceration facility. The more civilized exterior will simply obscure its real purpose, not to make life better for the Palestinian inmates, but to offer greater security to the Israeli guards. 
Now, observers have been regularly describing Gaza as an open-air prison at least since the late 1990s. And the term originates earlier than that, but that's when it becomes more common. The term has been used by activists in the Palestinians' corner, such as Noam Chomsky and Ralph Nader, by perhaps not so sympathetic officials, such as former World Bank head James Wolfenson, by humanitarian and human rights organizations like Doctors Without Borders and Beth Selim, by reporters writing for a range of outlets, and perhaps most importantly, by Palestinians themselves. And the twists offered by Banksy and the unnamed Israeli analyst suggest that conditions have become so dire that this language may now be inadequate to describe the state of affairs. Now, during the summer 2014 assault on Gaza, considerable media coverage was given to the Israeli tactic of calling people a few minutes before their homes were bombed. Some observers appeared to accept the Israeli contention that this was a humanitarian gesture. Others raised the question of where, in this landscape of violence, in a tiny, densely populated strip of land with no free points of exit, the inhabitants were supposed to go. As, you know, for example, John Stewart put it at the time, Evacuate to where? Have you seen Gaza? So Palestinians living in Gaza's open-air prison are not only targeted for attack, but are victimized by enforced immobility. Through years of policies of increasing closure and control and blockade, Israel has created this vulnerability, and then it deployed immobility as a lethal weapon. There is frequent reference in the media to, to the blockade imposed on Gaza in 2006 after Hamas won parliamentary elections. But the process of isolating Gaza began long before that, and I think that's important to remember. Understanding how immobility was imposed and then weaponized requires looking at the history of borders, movements, and constraints on motion that have defined this place since 1948. So the creation of Gaza the Gaza Strip as a distinct space was itself part of the isolation process. Before 1948, Gaza was part of Palestine, distinguished as a district, like other districts, but inseparable from the rest of the country. And this is a map of Mandate Palestine, and the, the red lines are the district boundaries. So again, those are administrative boundaries. They're not borders. They're not things that people would encounter um, in their lives. It just indicates how, how the governing structure worked. So the residents of Gaza, like residents of other parts of the country, could travel, frequently, could travel freely throughout Palestine. And of course, to be sure, during the years of the British Mandate, plenty of Palestinians, maybe especially women, didn't travel frequently or far from their home villages. But their capacity to move was not hindered by borders, by checkpoints, or by permits. So when I conducted interviews with Palestinians in Gaza in the late 1990s, this freedom of movement was one of the losses that they lamented. A number of the older among them remembered their travels around the country. As one person described, naming places that are now off limits, we used to go to Jaffa, Haifa, Jerusalem, etc. I used to go for a change of air. If I didn't like Jaffa, I could go to Haifa, Tel Aviv, or Jerusalem. If I didn't like Jerusalem, I could go to Nazar Nazareth or Safad. I used to go wherever I wanted. It was allowed. And these names were recited like talismans of lost connections. And part of what was lost was possibility, right? The possibility that one could move and could move just for a change of air, right? You don't need a purpose. You don't need a medical emergency to convince someone that you should be allowed to move. You can just move because you feel like it on that day. And 1948 changed all of that. Today, two-thirds of Gaza's residents are refugees, displaced from their villages before they were confined to Gaza. And when Palestinians became refugees in 1948, they did not cross an international border into displacement. They headed south or west, moving away from fighting, expelled by Israeli military forces, and only after the fact was a boundary marked between their homes and their places of refuge. And again, just to give you a visual, this, this is a map that shows the, the sort of full range of population movement that was happening in these years. So these borders, the borders of Gaza, are provisional, defined in the armistice agreement signed between Israel and Egypt, and Egypt governed the New Gaza Strip, in 1949. The armistice agreement was, quote, 
not to be construed in any sense as a political or territorial boundary and is delineated without prejudice to rights, claims, and positions of either party to the armistice as regards ultimate settlement of the Palestine question. But of course, despite this language, this boundary has functioned as a political boundary and it has prejudiced the rights and claims of Palestinians. This border has determined much of the, of the fate of Gazans. They have lived generations now in displacement, sometimes just a few miles from their homes and villages. And their movement within and beyond Gaza's borders has been subject to the whims of occupying and neighboring powers. And just to give you a little closer map of Gaza. So displacement is a process. Right? It takes time for people to fully understand that their homes and previous lives have been lost. And so too is isolation and confinement. The official creation of a border and the on-the-ground work of border making often proceed at different rhythms. As happened in other border zones with, with 1948 Palestine, for several years refugees in Gaza tried to cross back to retrieve possessions from their homes. They were shot at by Israeli forces and sometimes imprisoned by Egyptians. Now these first early crossings were not a strategic response to loss or an organized effort to reconstitute a stable home. Rather, this kind of walking through risk constituted a practice, again, rather than a plan or a strategy, a practice of denial of the dispossession that was underway. This denial was not necessarily a conscious response, but rather was a condition of getting by. At this early point, lands that were now occupied by Israel were not yet experienced as separate from the territory where people were temporarily, they thought, living. The relationship of Palestinians to their land was not yet transformed into a longing for what had been lost, but remained embedded in the realm of the practical and the mundane. Even as getting there had become dangerous, going there, and especially going there for everyday purposes, helped keep home close. And one of the things that people told me a lot about was that in the sort of immediate aftermath of people moving was that harvest time came, and people would try to go back to harvest. Or they left their homes with almost nothing because they didn't know that they would be gone for more than a few days, and they tried to, were trying to get some of these possessions. So, so people were, for a period of time, maintaining an active, even if increasingly distant, relationship with these homes. But ultimately, there were too many forces arrayed against a continued active relationship with these lost homes. Egyptian administrators, concerned about inviting Israeli incursions into Gaza, and also concerned about independent Palestinian action, worked to halt this movement over the armistice line. And they mobilized local leaders to help in this effort. So in a meeting with Mukhtars, the village leaders, not long into the Egypt period of the Egyptian administration, an Egyptian army officer put responsibility for compliance on their shoulders. And he said, I consider you responsible for making the people understand what is required of them to respect the armistice conditions and not cross the armistice line under any circumstances. It is your obligation to guarantee the implementation of this condition by informing us about each violator of these regulations immediately so that he can be given the strongest punishment. Um, and there was a brief period a few years later when Egypt did give support for Palestinian Fedayeen, guerrillas, in launching attacks across the line. But for most of the period of, of Egyptian administration, they worked to control this kind of movement. So even as access to the rest of Palestine was increasingly impossible for Gazans, during the 20 years of Egyptian rule, movement was possible with a permit across the southern border into Sinai. Palestinians went to university in Egypt, they got jobs in the Gulf, they traveled, they were connected to the larger community of displaced Palestinians. And also other people traveled to Gaza not just humanitarian workers and peacekeeping soldiers, but tourists from other Arab countries, encouraged by the duty-free zone that Egypt established in Gaza. Um, and it was during this period that a, a series of hotels went up a, along the beach, um, many of which are still there. 
Um, and during this period, Palestinians also came to have a relationship with the new space of the Gaza Strip, right, to feel at home there, even as they longed for their homes on the other side of the armistice line. Now, with the Israeli occupation of the Gaza Strip, along with the West Bank, in 1967, people were able to visit, though not reclaim those homes. The Israeli government's interest in incorporating the occupied territories, though not their population, into Israel required that the borders be relatively porous. Um, and this is an image of, people may be familiar with the Erez checkpoint, and I'll show you later an image of it today, but this was, a, this was Erez um, shortly after 1967. So again, so it is marked, but it is not restrictive in the way that, that it is now. So the te and during this period, the territories became frequent shopping destinations for Israelis. Right? And Gaza, in particular, became known for its cheap car mechanics. So for in, until the period of the first intifada, Israel, Israelis, whenever possible, brought their cars to Gaza. And even if Israel did not want the Palestinian inhabitants of the territory, uh, granting them citizenship, of course, would have immediately threatened the Jewish majority in Israel. It did want their labor. So Palestinian movement was relatively unimpeded for the first 25 years of the occupation. Along with the workers who came from the territories for jobs, Palestinians were able to travel for leisure, study, and to visit family members. So there was new patterns of movement that opened up by the, by the Israeli occupation of the West Bank and Gaza, both between Gaza and the West Bank and between Gaza and the West Bank and the rest of historic Palestine. But a few years into the First Intifada, the uprising, which began in December 1987, Israel began to impose restrictions on Palestinian movement from the territories. And it did this from Gaza and for around Gaza first, while simultaneously be beginning to bring in foreign laborers to take the place of Palestinian workers. Um, this is a, I just sort of like this picture, so I want to show you. This is a picture of, you know, during the er early days of the first Intifada. And one of the things that, that I remember very strongly about, the, about Gaza at that time was, you know, in the north of the Gaza Strip, after you've crossed into Erez, there was this um, sort of metal banner across the road saying in English and in Hebrew, welcome to Gaza. Um, so, <clears throat> so the first steps in developing a comprehensive pass system were imposed in Gaza in the late 1980s. And residents who wished to move were required to get a security services approved magnetic card in addition to the ID card required of everyone. So you're beginning to move from prior to that people could, the default was that people could move, not move into Israel, but move through Israel, move, spend their days there working. And then you begin a process where that, where the default comes to be nobody can move. And one, the, one of the first steps of that was identifying a subset of the population who couldn't. So you needed to get this card to show that you weren't basically a banned person. So the Israeli closure policy, wherein any Palestinian movement required a permit, was fully developed after 1991, and the first Gulf War provided the occasion for the first comprehensive closure of the territories. With these restrictions in place, the number of Palestinians working in Israel de decreased dramatically, and people's capacity to move between Gaza and the West Bank severely diminished. Now, rather than easing these conditions, the Oslo Accords that were signed between Israel and the Palestinians in 1993 consolidated them. Gaza was fenced off many years before the wall was built in the West Bank. And an immediate consequence of Oslo was that movement between the West Bank and Gaza became nearly impossible for most Palestinians, those who did not qualify for VIP status. Goods could still enter, and Gaza was a major market for Israeli products, but people could no longer reach the other parts and people of Palestine. And of course, the Oslo process had many consequences for Palestinians. Among them was the further entrenchment of the process that began during the Intifada of transforming Gaza from a labor reserve for Israeli industry and a captive market for Israeli goods to really being seen only as the latter. 
As is the case with so, in so many places around the world, where capital flows relatively easily, but people's movements are constrained, the separation from the occupied territories that Israel pursued in those years was a separation of population, and Israeli citizens were also barred from entering Gaza and all Area A, which, that is Palestinian Authority controlled spaces, but not of markets. Um, and so here's a more recent picture of the era's crossing point. Um, and it just, you know, with each passing year, it gets more and more elaborate, si similar to the checkpoints in the West Bank. And when I was researching and living in Gaza in the late 1990s, which was late in the kind of peaceful days of Oslo, movement in and out of Gaza for foreigners like me was relatively unimpeded, which is no longer the case. But at that time, I could go with, in and out with no problem. But this was not true for Palestinians. So, you know, a, another foreigner I knew, a, a, a researcher who was working in the West Bank, visited me in Gaza to add comparative perspective to her West Bank-based research on how young people experience the landscapes of restriction and circuitous movement that characterize the Oslo period occupation, right? Already in the West Bank at this time, there were log there was a permit regime, there were checkpoints, there was all sorts of things that were disrupting people's movement. Um, and so she was interested in trying to ha have understand that. But the framework of her inquiry, looking at a place that was really constrained, was not adequate for Gaza or was ill-suited to Gaza's isolation. Her opening question, which, she, which was how she usually started her research interviews, how far does Jerusalem feel to you? And that she meant to sort of elicit from people what, you know, what it took them to get there, how often they might go, what kind of relationship they felt to this place that for people in the West Bank was in fact quite close. That question was basically a non-starter in a context where people had pretty much zero chance of reaching that destination. So rather than offering stories about the convoluted space and time of occupation, things like off-roading around checkpoints or never being able to predict how long a journey might take, these are the things that you would hear in the West Bank, the young Gazans that she met usually said that they had never left Gaza. And most did not seem to think that it likely that they would do so anytime soon. And remember, this is the late 1990s. This is a period of quiet, of peace. This is the height of Oslo. This is not under what we now talk about as the blockade of Gaza. This is not after the Second Intifada. This is, this is in some sense, what should have been the best time. And, Ga and young Gazans were very restricted in their movement. Now, of course, Israeli restrictions on Palestinian movement have multiplied extraordinarily in recent years. And this isolation not only harms individuals, impeding their ability to live full lives, it also impairs the Palestinian political community increasing distance, distrust, and ultimately division between the West Bank and Gaza. During the Second Intifada, Israel began to restrict international's entrance into the Strip too. So having already essentially prohibited Palestinian travel through the Erez crossing, Israel's response to Hamas's victory in parliamentary elections in 2006, which was then followed by its takeover of Gaza in 2007, was to impose a blockade on the entrance of many goods into Gaza, along with the export of Gazan products. The tunnel economy that emerged during this time was one Palestinian response to these restrictions. Now, since the southern part of Gaza borders Egypt, the blockade could only have been successful with Egyptian cooperation. And I think it's important to remember this as well. And under Mubarak, the Egyptian government heavily controlled movement in and out of Gaza. After Hamas took control of Gaza, and therefore also of the Rafah border crossing into Egypt, the Egyptian government formally closed the border. In practice, the crossing was opened on an ad hoc basis with the claim of humanitarian concern, that there had to be some capacity to let people out. But at the same time, despite its significant security concerns, the Egyptian government took only limited action then against the extensive network of tunnels that had been developed for the import of otherwise banned goods into Gaza. And people may have seen images of the tunnels, but these are just a couple of them. And this is, you know, livestock is one of the things that people brought through the tunnels. And these tunnels were vital for the economy and survival of the Strip. And they were also a significant source of income for Hamas. So they essentially were a source of, of taxation for the Hamas government. When Mubarak was de deposed in February 2011, 
Many Palestinians hoped for a dramatically different Egyptian policy toward Gaza, but this was not forthcoming. Whether under military rule, first in the form of the Supreme Council of the Armed Forces and later under the rule of General Sisi, or under Mohamed Morsi of the Muslim Brotherhood, promises to fully open the border have not been fulfilled. And the fall of Mubarak did, though, sort of reinvigorate, bring new attention to Gaza's place in Egyptian discourse about security threats. Right? It had this, has had this place for a long time, but in the sort of current landscape in Egypt, um, and especially now with the Muslim Brotherhood as, you know, w once again the enemy, Gaza is seen as a as a space and a site of that. Um, so in the wake of the military takeover of its government in July 2013, Egypt intensified a project that had already begun under Morsi to destroy the tunnels. Um, and according to UN official, by the end of July of that year, 2013, 80 percent of the tunnels had been destroyed, leading to shortages of fuel and building materials. At the same time, the military made statements that suggested a willingness to launch attacks on perceived security threats in Gaza. And when Israel attacked Gaza in 2014, the government of then newly elected President Sisi was ambivalent at the, at maybe at best ambivalent about or even supportive of the assault. So the intense hostility to the Muslim Brotherhood that dominated Egyptian dis public discourse after the military coup carried over seemingly in its entirety to the evaluation of Hamas and the interpretation of events in Gaza. Now, during the, the period of the Egyptian administration in Gaza, right, from 48 to 67, Gazans were perceived um, by administrators as both threats and objects of protection. In 2014, they increasingly appeared to be viewed by the Egyptian government and a portion of the Egyptian people solely as threats. Now, the cycles of destruction in Gaza have sped up over the last decade. In addition to the devastating siege and blockade of the past eight, nine, ten years, and the constraining closure regime of the past 25, in the last seven years, Israeli forces have launched three assaults on the Strip, two involving a significant ground invasion, all involving massive destruction. And humanitarian agencies confront this cycle of destruction on the ground. When the smoke clears from whatever is the latest round of catastrophic violence, humanitarian workers have to make the rounds to see what remains, right, of the lives that people were living and of the projects which their agencies have supported. So one consequence of the repeated assaults on Gaza for humanitarian organizations is the necessity of repeatedly rebuilding the same projects. Israeli military strategists refer to the practice of the periodic targeting of Gaza as mowing the lawn. As Ephraim Inbar described it in the Jerusalem Post, Israel simply needs to mow the grass once in a while to degrade the enemy's capabilities. Keeping the enemy off balance and reducing its capabilities requires Israeli military readiness and a willingness to use force intermittently. Israeli defense of the strategy focuses on Hamas as the target with the effects on Palestinian society regulated to collateral damage. But as Muin Rabani and many others have pointed out, the real target of these assaults are the Palestinian population and Palestinian society. So in some sense, the reference to mowing the lawn, which perhaps suggests that the grass is allowed to grow unimpeded in between mowings, doesn't fully capture the nature of this policy. Um, these regular assaults not only result in catastrophic loss of life and damage to infrastructure, they produce a degradation of the underlying normal. So when each round of attack concludes, conditions of life in Gaza return to an everyday that is somewhat worse than before. This process, as it is intended to, interrupts political engagement, economic activity, and social life. And it transforms people's expectations for the future, as everyone assumes, knows, that another attack will come. So I want to turn now to the experiences of living under attack in a place that one cannot flee. Um, and as I mentioned before, over the pa past number of years, my research has focused on Palestinian experiences living with humanitarianism. So I want, in the context of my consideration here of mobility control in Gaza, 
I want to use the lens of the experience of Gazans, who are also humanitarian workers, to think about how people live when they cannot leave the scene of attack. Now, Didier Fassin has written very thoughtfully about the challenges revealed about humanitarian ethics and practice by a decision of six international MSF Doctors Without Borders staff to stay in Iraq in the advance of the 2003 U.S. bombing campaign in an act of solidarity with vulnerable Iraqis. So this act of solidarity was meant to make a claim about the equality of lives across geopolitical differences. But this decision was reversed in the aftermath of the kidnapping of two MSF employees. So Fassan reflects on this instance to make the point that lives are never, in fact, equally valued. MSF employees can choose to expose themselves, but only up to a point. And Iraqis had no choice at all in the matter. The very act which was meant to forward the claim that all lives are equally valued underscored the tragic reality that they are not. And this instance was a lesson about the ethics of humanitarian presence, though not the lesson that had been intended. The production and reproduction of hierarchies of humankinds constitutes a politics of life that ramifies far beyond the humanitarian space. Now, the case that Fassan describes, as with many other ethnographic accounts of humanitarian work, involved foreign humanitarians confronting their distance from local victims. But many, probably all, humanitarian agencies also hire local staff. And Peter Redfield has explored the challenges that MSF has faced as it has tried to reconcile the different statuses of international and local staff within an organization. In Gaza, and in the Palestinian case more broadly, the vast, vast majority of humanitarian workers are Palestinian. So in the case of UNRWA, which is the UN agency that provides relief to Palestinian refugees, 95 percent of the staff are Palestinian refugees. In fact, pretty much there is a, there is a sort of a color bar to the, at the very top of the organization. Palestinians do not lead the organization, but they, they staff it high up into administrative positions. Now, of course, the fact that Palestinians are the, are the vast majority does not obviate the hierarchies of humanitarian action and the gap between workers on the ground and planners in the metropole, but it very much impacts the dynamics of humanitarian labor. So being both a humanitarian worker and a refugee has contradictory effects. So for example, to take another humanitarian organization, the entirety of ANERA staff, and ANERA is an American humanitarian organization working with Palestinian refugees, the entirety of ANERA staff in Gaza are Palestinians. And when events such as Israel's summer 2014 assault on Gaza happen, they are its targets, its victims, and its first responders. From July 10th until August 27th, Rania Al-Hilu, who was the ANERA communications officer in Gaza, wrote a daily journal about her experience living under attack. And reading this blog is one way into seeing the double experience of victim and humanitarian in the midst of catastrophe. And of course, the blog itself is part of the work of a communication officer to narrate for the world and also for potential donors, the experiences of Gazans under assault. So of course, it is not, in a, and no blog is, but it, this is certainly not an unmediated expression of experience, but it's doing the work of producing a humanitarian narrative. Excerpts from the blog illuminate aspects of the, again, this double experience of being victim and provider. The entry for July 25th, already well into the assault, states, Every time I write in this journal, I want to start it with, I'm still alive. We survived another day. Nothing ever gets any better. My aunt called to say that she has allowed displaced people from Shijaiya to camp out in her backyard. She said they were in need of everything and wondered if we had some clothes that we could donate. I put together a bag of things and was able to find a taxi to drive it over to her place. This is a time when we have to come together and take care of each other. So this post describes the apparently contradictory but frequently mutually occurring contraction and expansion that occurs in a crisis. Right? There is a narrowing of focus to survival. I'm still alive. We made it through the day. Um, and in another post, Ranyal Hilu describes this contracting horizon as a widespread condition. 
One thing that struck me today is how people's dreams have shrunken to the basic necessities of life. They want water to drink, they want to bathe, they want food. One elderly man was terribly worried about not being able to get medicines for his diabetes, and all of them just want to go back to their own homes. All right, so this kind of contraction is a, is a common feature of catastrophe. But along with this contraction, catastrophe also expands networks of mutual care and concern. And what, what Rania Helu recounts about Gaza in 2014 echoes things that I heard from people in the aftermath of, about the aftermath of 1948 when many refugees to Gaza found initial shelter in the homes and lands of native Gazans. And in those stories, I also heard about the tensions that emerged fairly quickly as the displaced overwhelmed the existing structures of mutual support. And as the catastrophe blurs back into the cruddy in Gaza, I think these tensions are evident there as well. In other postings, Alhilo directly talks about the challenges of being a humanitarian worker also living under assault. And she begins by talking about her husband's work. My husband works for UNRWA as an ar architectural engineer. He was called in today to work on installing indoor and outdoor showers at the UNRWA schools where displaced people are taking shelter. The issue of hygiene is a growing health problem and infections are starting to spread. So I'm glad that my husband can go and make a direct difference for suffering people. But I'm very scared because conditions are extremely dangerous. Yesterday, three humanitarian relief workers were killed two of whom are from the UN. This morning, a school was bombed. So unlike the international humanitarian workers that Didier Fassan described, who wanted to stay in Iraq when the US began bombing in 2003, but who were compelled to leave when some were kidnapped, Gazan humanitarian workers do not have the option of leaving the scene of attack. The entire Gaza Strip was under assault. But they, too, have to repeatedly make the choice to expose themselves to a degree of vulnerability by going out to work rather than sheltering at home. And there's a somewhat different valence to this exposure than the aborted exposure that Fassan talks about. MSF doctors sought unsuccessfully to express a posture of equality, of sameness, at least sameness of value, with Iraqis under attack. In going out to work, Gazan humanitarian workers distinguish themselves from other Gazans under assault, not in terms of value, but experience. The imperative to do something, which motivates so much humanitarian labor, in this case is also a means of having a different experience of the assault, right? to not just be a victim, but also be an actor. As a communications officer, Alhilo's work didn't put her into the field in the same way. For her, the danger is getting cut off from the world. With a generator at home, she was able to get a certain amount of electricity each day, despite the fact that the power plant was damaged. But she wondered, how long will the fuel hold out? I've started to take handwritten notes, keeping my notepad near me all the time, and writing with it held close up to my face so I can see what's on the page. This way I capture my thoughts and have them ready either to type out quickly or to relate to a colleague in Washington. So in this worry about isolation, her experiences link her to the rest of the population. But in her access to a venue in which to amplify and narrate her experience, her experience remains distinct. In the last post in her journal, Elhilo recounts the reopening of the Anera office once the ceasefire began. After our greetings, hugs, and handshakes in the office this morning, we immediately got to work with calls and coordination of relief deliveries. This is the fuel that keeps us all going. We all consider ourselves survivors. We exist. Why do we exist? Because our existence has meaning. That meaning is to help the people of Gaza to recover and rebuild their lives and the dignity they deserve. So part of what humanitarian work does is enable Alhilu and others like her to struggle against the narrowing of horizons, visions, and expectations that crisis can produce. So even as humanitarianism is a form of intervention with a self-consciously limited aim, working as a humanitarian actor perhaps especially while one is also a humanitarian victim, can be part of an effort to pursue a continued expansion of what it means to live and what it means to give value to Palestinian lives. So the 2014 attacks prompted some international humanitarian organizations to question their role in this process of repeated destruction. And an MSF official decried the circumstances of working 
in an open-air prison to patch up prisoners in between their torture sessions. Some of the prisoners have organized into armed groups and resist their indefinite destruction by firing rockets over the prison wall. However, the prison guards are the ones who have the capacity to launch large-scale and highly destructive attacks on the open-air prison. That MSF felt compelled to move beyond its usual stance of being a witness to suffering but not judging causes indicates both the extremity of the suffering and the immensity of the imbalance and responsibility for it. So here I want to circle back to the open-air prison as a description of Gaza. What does the term connote? What are people trying to point out about Gaza's conditions by using it? Now, obviously, perhaps the first reference for the term is that the control over people's movement that has been a central, ha, has been a central part of Israeli occupation practice. Right? It's not unagentive lack of movement. It is a, it is a policy. Um, and this is what Sinn Féin's Jerry Adams pointed to when he said in 2009 that this is a total denial of the rights of the pa people of Palestine. This is an open-air prison. People can't get out, travel out of here. They can't travel in. And of course, it is not only advocates for Palestinian rights who have noted this control. In the midst of the 2014 attack, the New York Times reported that the vast majority of Gazans cannot leave Gaza. Prime Minister David Cameron of Britain in 2010 called Gaza an open-air prison, drawing criticism from Israel. But in reality, the vast majority of Gazans are effectively trapped. So Gazans suffer from their inability to move. Even Israeli condition, officials might concede this point, though they would disagree about who is responsible for this condition. And responsibility is a second referent in the term open-air prison. It is meant to indicate not only that Palestinians in Gaza cannot move, but also that Gaza is not independent. Israel, the occupying power, controls movement and is responsible for these conditions. Reporting on the Hamas takeover of the Strip in 2007, The Guardian reported, the Palestinians can be blamed for weak leadership, but the impoverishment and fragmentation of Gaza is a result not just of tribal Palestinian politics, but of the cumulative despair generated by living in an open-air prison. As Israel is the jailer, it bears responsibilities, too, for the conditions inside. And as a letter to the Washington Post put it, Gaza has been turned into an open-air prison with all its borders, land, sea, and air controlled by Israel. The insistence on Israeli responsibility has only become more urgent in the years since the 2005 pullout of Jewish settlers and soldiers to the border, because Israeli officials have since argued that they no longer occupy Gaza. The United Nations and experts in international law tend to disagree. So prison life is about confinement and loss of control. And it is also experienced, to go back to what I was talking about, about catastrophe, as a narrowing of life possibilities and future horizons. A February 2015 report in the Washington Post put it starkly, in almost every way, the Gaza Strip is much worse off now than before last summer's war between Israel and Hamas. Scenes of misery are one of the few things in abundance in this battered coastal enclave. Palestinians in Gaza say they are trapped more than ever in what they call an open-air prison. So with the dramatic destruction of 2014 maybe still relatively fresh in our minds, one can forget just how bad things were before. In the summer of 2002, at the height of the Second Intifada and the Israeli, and Israeli armed incursions into Palestinian cities, the head of Refugee Trust International wrote that Palestinians were imperiled by malnutrition, ill health, psychosocial trauma, depression, and psychosis. Agriculture is on the verge of collapse, livelihoods are threatened, and for many people, destitution is close. He continued, indeed, the fact that on any day over one million people are denied free movement by armed soldiers means that citizens of the West Bank and Gaza are being held in the largest open-air prison in the world today. So here you see a note, I've been talking about Gaza as an open-air prison. The West Bank is also sometimes talked about um, in these terms. So in addition to this kind of shifting geography of the term open-air prison, there's also have been shifting temporalities in the term's deployment. Sometimes it is offered as a description of what is. Gazans are now living in an open-air prison. And sometimes it is offered as a warning of what may be to come. And the building of the wall in the West Bank was one occasion where open-air prison was sort of used as a warning. 
and people saying, if you build this wall, people will be in an open-air prison, even though there were already many barriers to movement that might make the term appropriate. Another was the, pl the planned Israeli disengagement from Gaza in 2005. So uh, ahead of it, an editorial reported on Palestinian fears that the pullout set to begin next week will simply turn the narrow, overcrowded strip of land into an open-air prison whose borders and destiny will remain under Israeli supervision. So remember, by 2005, people had already long been talking about Gaza as an open-air prison, but this occasion of a new, of a shift and of a potential new restriction introduces sort of a future temporality to that term that had been a present, for, uh, present term. And these concerns are echoed by international activists who said at the time, a Gaza Strip without Jewish settlement will be little more than an open-air prison for Palestinians unless the international community puts pressure on Israeli Prime Minister Ariel Sharon to also relinquish control over land, sea, and air access to the territory. So what does it mean that there are warnings of a possible future that is also the present condition? For one thing, I think it highlights the ongoing and steady degradation of Gaza's condition. As bad as the present may be, there always seems to be a worse future yet to come. And for another, it points to the inadequacy of existing vocabulary to properly name this condition. As much as the term open-air prison calls attention to confinement and control, it might also suggest a process of ordered judgment that may unwittingly accept that Palestinians in Gaza deserve their punishment. As much as it underscores the degradation of daily life, it might also suggest a degree of routinized regularity that belies the threatening reality of life in Gaza. As a resident of Rafah put it, this is worse than a prison. In prison, you can be safe. Here, you are in danger all the time. And he said this in 2001. So Gazans are immobilized in every sense, cut off from other members of their community, isolated from the international community, deprived of economic opportunity, basic goods, and access to advanced medical care. So imposed immobility is itself a form of violence against people, and it cruelly magnifies the violence of military assault. The 2014 catastrophe in Gaza was a product of years of preparation. Restriction of Palestinian movement goes back to their displacement in 1948, and mobility management has been a central tactic of Israeli occupation since 1967. The phone call ahead of the bomb, the roof knock, like a small bomb, ahead of the lethal strike are twists in this long trajectory. That sometimes the phone call is not followed by a strike underscores its potency in psychological warfare. And these tactics are yet another weapon in the massive arsenal displayed against Palestinians. In the aftermath of, some of the summer 2014's assault, Gaza's new condition appeared marked by a desire to escape. Palestinians in Gaza have always wanted to be able to move freely inside and outside of Palestine, but have not generally been driven by an imperative to escape Gaza. As Khalil Shaheen of the Palestinian Center for Human Rights described, life before the war was already miserable, and in the onslaught, families lost their properties, their memories, and their families. They lost everything, and now they face a loss of human dignity with limited access to water, food, shelter, and health care. The consequences of trying to escape under conditions of isolation were made tragically clear in the September 2014 sinking of a boat filled with many fleeing Gazans. And this is part of, of course, a broader landscape where we see this kind of thing. A migrant smuggling boat filled with approximately 500 people was rammed by smugglers when the captain refused an order to transfer the passengers into a much smaller boat that he said would sink under their weight. Most on board, including the captain, drowned when the boat sank. According to a report by The Guardian, perhaps as many as 200 were from Gaza, and also on board were Palestinians from the Yanmuk camp in Syria. So the fact of impoverished people paying large sums of money to smugglers and taking significant risks with their lives in the hopes of reaching a place with more opportunity is horribly a regular feature of our unequal world. And the language in which this event was reported, right, is the sinking of a migrant boat, locates this event in the realm of global precarity. But it is a relatively new part of the Gazan experience. 
This phenomenon is a product of both the continuing degradation of the quality of life in Gaza, squeezed by economic blockade and suffering repeated material destruction, and the increasing immobility of its population. In earlier periods of economic difficulty at home um, in Gaza, more Gazans had outlets for legal travel for work abroad. Grinding poverty, a sense of futility about the future, and the promise that things could and could only be better elsewhere are global conditions of chronic suffering. In Gaza, they are direct outcomes of Israeli policy, Egyptian complicity, and international indifference. The tunnels that for many years the blockade on Gaza helped sustain its economic life, those that, that still remained, were put to use in ferrying people, mostly young men, out of Gaza and into a network of smugglers. And of course, most of these tunnels have now been destroyed. And I'll conclude, but I want to give the last word to UNRWA, again, the agency which provides relief to Palestinian refugees, which on October 21st, so just a few days ago, issued a statement on the beginning of the 10th year of the blockade on Gaza. We warned already four years ago that the Gaza Strip will become unlivable, meaning that there will effectively not be enough resources for people to survive by 2020. This is in less than four years. When a place becomes unlivable, people move. This is the case for environmental disasters such as droughts or for conflicts such as in Syria. Yet this last resort is denied to the people of Gaza. They cannot move beyond their 365 square kilometers territory. They cannot escape, not the devastating poverty or the fear of another conflict. Thank you very much. And so I am happy to take questions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> I'm not even sure that's on the table anymore, to, to, to be frank. I mean, the, you know, if we look to, I mean, Gaza is a space that the, over the last number of years, the policy has been starve, contain, control, mostly keep just above the level of a humanitarian catastrophe, except in these moments, but mostly, you know, make it a humanitarian space that the international community can, can keep people alive. But the West Bank is kind of a counterexample, perhaps to what it, you know, not is the best that it can be, but what is seen as, as a plausible, I don't know if solution is the right word, but a plausible direction for things, which is not to create free movement between the West Bank and Gaza or the West Bank and Israel, not to create, you know, really, you know, the capacity for, for labor to, to move, but to create a, a um, within the confines of spaces, that, of Palestinian spaces, to create, create a sense of possibility of movement and of, of not daily assault, and to create opportunities for, for, for some economic, maybe we could even say development, so economic activity, certainly, that, that would, um, oh here, my editorial, that would distract people from, from, the, from the politics of, of control. And so that's not a, that's not a return to the to that that more fluid time of movement. I, partly, I, you know, yeah, I don't I don't see going back to, but it's an effort to create a different kind of space where Israeli security concerns are are addressed and where Palestinians are not in active um, revolt against the against the conditions of occupation. 
But I don't know, you know, so that's, that's sort of where things are now, is this division of two different kinds of t approaches to um, these two territories. I don't know where things are going. I don't, I don't see um, a lot of, or any, reason for optimism. But the fact that I don't see it doesn't mean it will never happen, right? Th things, things happen that, you know, when something, this is such a bad situation, if something happens, it's going to be surprising. And I think this is actually part of the problem I, you know, I, I live and work in D.C., which has this sort of policy world all around it. And one of the real problems that I see with the policy framework for thinking about the, the situation there, and I think this also governs Israeli and Palestinian efforts to talk about this, is that people think the future is known. What we just don't know is how to get there. Right, the two-state solution, the two-state solution. We all know, you know, this is a common thing. You, people in D.C. love to talk in these like kind of sound bites. But, we all know what the answer is. You know, we just have to figure out the mechanism. And so that, that's the problem. If people just need to stop thinking they know what the future is or what the solution is and recognize that we need, a, everybody needs a much more open, creative, um, new way of thinking. I don't, know what, I don't know what the answer is, but being boxed into this idea that we, we have a sense of how it will be solved. We just don't know how to get the parties to do it is, to me, a, a big part of the problem. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, I I think there are many many factors that have that have led to to U.S. policy, both including you domestic issues and and the sense of domestic politics. Palestinians have not had, had for, Palestinians have not had a constituency, or have not had a voice to U.S. policy. Israelis have um, also a sense, you know, U.S. sense of the of politics on the ground in the, in the region. Not always, I mean, the U.S. hasn't always made the right choices, but I think, I think there have been a, a, you know, multiple things that have led us into this situation. And again, just like the, I, I, I'm not gonna, I don't think I'm gonna have any, anything very optimistic to say about anything. I don't, I don't know quite what the way forward is on this. One thing that, that does seem clear to me is that there is an increasing gap between U.S. – well, there's always been a gap between U.S. policy and U.S. practice, right? U.S. policy is, is in fact, stated policy, like what is uh, – for formal policy is more neutral than, than U.S. practice, right? Um, and there, there is also an increasing gap between both of those things and public opinion of Americans. Um, and, and, there, and especially when you go generally, generationally. I think this is this is really changing now. With what speed will that transformation have an influence back on either U.S. policy or U.S. practice? This is not a slow. I mean, this is not a fast process. It's a slow process, and all sorts of things can happen to impede it. But I think um, there are things that we can, you know, those of us who are Americans, can do to try to amplify um, the the. And point to that gap, and that that U.S. policy does not represent what we think. So, yeah. Um, just to bring things full circle, mm -hmm. um, your country continues to emphasize the uh, fact that mobility is going to end in three decades in Gaza, not just after the blockade of the Gaza Strip by the U.S. Mm -hmm. Why don't you talk about the extent to which the blockade represented uh, a massive uh, change in policy regarding the mobilization of the resettlement? Right. Thanks. That's a good question. I actually think that in some ways the, the, the biggest change that the blockade imposed, I mean, it, it deepened people's immobility, but it, but it, it, you know, prior to that, Gaza was really a market for Israeli goods. There were lots of, there, you know, and so the biggest change was about, was about what goods could go in and out, I think. And again, not to say that it didn't have an impact on people's mobility, it did. It just made every, you know, what was already a system a very controlled mobility where lots of people couldn't move got even harder, right? Even fewer opportunities for movement. But the control of, of the flow of, of goods 
was dramatically changed um, by by the blockade. But I, I do think, I mean, yeah, I mean, the, I think it's important to remember be, the the length of this with with almost everything. You know, we have. Um, because any place, and I don't think Gaza is unique in this, but Gaza has had so many repeated crises. A place of repeated crises and repeated catastrophes can ha do some work of kind of evacuating history, right? Because the present is always so pressing. And it is important. It's important for humanitarian actors, for political actors, for citizens to point, to call attention to what is happening at any given moment. But in doing that, it you know, and in, in saying like, this is so terrible, this is this you know this th this is what's going on. People are being stopped from moving. People are being killed. It can kind of, even if not explicitly, can lead to re mis not remembering that people were already unable to move. People were already being people were already being degraded in this way. So that's that's partly why I want to point to that. But I think it's also sort of as a matter of analysis, as your question kind of suggests, you sort of noting what happens with each of these because it's not just it's almost the same thing over and over again, but not quite, right? Something happens with each new form of control, each new layer of immobility. A, there is a shift in, in, one, how you might move if you were going to evade it, right? That becomes different when, with, when new regulations come into place, and then sort of what the forms of, of daily life, what's possible in kind of daily life as different kinds of restrictions go into place. So there is something shifting, even as there is this ongoing process. Yeah, I mean, one of the, I mean, I do think the, you know, the, the sort of a, a approach to the West Bank, as I suggested before, is slightly different than than in Gaza, and there's there is there are more spaces um, to try to create a compliant. I think there's an aim to create a compliant population that I don't think there's an effort to there's an there's a, an effort in Gaza to create a, a defeated population, but there's there's less being offered. For on the sort of compliance side. But it is quite striking the ways in which, I mean, this goes back to the, the question of, you know, sort of U.S. complicity, and of course not just the U.S. This is, this kind of repeated destruction, and it does happen at a smaller scale in, in, in the West Bank as well, is in some sense only possible because of the willingness of the international community not only to sort of stand by and let it happen, but to pay for it, right? To pay for reconstruction every time. Um, because it wouldn't be, te you know, the, you know, it, it's a, there is a kind of calibration between destruction and keeping people going, and you, can, you if you don't have any reconstruction, people can't keep going, um, and so you know, and there, you know, donor countries, humanitarian organizations come in um, and do this work to rebuild, whether it's you know at this sort of massive scale of Gaza or. Like in, in Area C in the West Bank, which is the parts of the West Bank that where Israel maintains both military and administrative control, you know, uh, international community or international agency, you know, water well project destroyed, rebuilt, destroyed, rebuilt. You know, so the same kinds of process at a, at a slightly different scale happens there as well. I mean, and there are, you know, after 2014, there was some sense, like at the donor conference, some sense of donor fatigue, like maybe we can't keep doing this for forever, but I don't really see, I haven't seen a massive loss of appetite um, to do that, and that's partly, um, I see it on the U.S. side as kind of, well, we're not really willing to actually change our policy or put significant pressure on Israel, but we'll give you, the Palestinians, billions of dollars. <laughs> um, and so like that's, you know, they're not, they're not equal offers. Be, um, but that's kind of what I see happening. So, yeah. Well, Laura, uh, thank you so much. I, I really appreciate the, the depth of your insight on all this and uh, uh, your historical perspective, mm -hmm. uh, along with the anthropological. Uh, it's so 
Right. Well, uh, no, that, thank you, and you're right. I mean, I actually see like being able to provide not that not that policymakers are would are listening to me, but um, but I but I do think being able to provide th this another kind of analysis in a world where what you're describing is the is the dominant narrative is 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 policy relevant? Like it's important policy work. Like trying to just do that of trying of saying that there is another framework for understanding this is. Um, so whenever those 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 moments where I'm either given the opportunity or compelled <laughs> to to be in an environment where where um, people are are where there is this sort of policy world, I try I try to actually my strategy in some sense is not to first go to where they are and and try to chip away at it, but to start from someplace really different to maybe say okay, you know, but but your but your point is very well taken, which is that this is the, that. The, the narrative of the Palestinian experience that is, I mean, this is one of the reasons that, I'm, that I'm, I find the, the world of policy on Israel-Palestine especially so frustrating is that it takes place in a fantasy world. Um, and not to say that all parts of my analysis are always going to be 100% accurate, but I, but I try to start with what is happening in the world. And policy on Palestine and Israel does not. It starts with a set of Sort of pre predetermined boxes of this is how, you know that that the big you know that we all, we are all familiar with them. Um, but I think that um, one can also point to if there if the question I mean because of course within the 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 U.S. policy circles the question of Israel's security is is sort of the dominant one, um, and I think you cannot you I, I would say you cannot solve a security problem for Israel when you ha engage in continued assault of a population in all of its in all of its guises so it's not just those you know periodic mowings of the lawn where when when the military goes in this entire policy is an ongoing assault on a population which will only not only does it do massive harm to Palestinians it's going to do massive harm to to Israeli security interests as well so it's bad Po policy from the side of Israel, I would say, and it's bad policy for the U.S. to support it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So again, you know, I <clears throat> I have not been in Gaza. Um, s yeah, in more than fifteen years at, the, at this point. So the so what I know about the sort of current intensity of of relationships through and around factions is what I read. What what you can read. I haven't experienced it ethnographically, but what what I would say from the time that I was there. So this was a time again when the Palestinian Authority um, was. Gov governed Gaza and had the greatest continuity of territory of any sp any space where the authority was operating. So this was Gaza was the closest you had to kind of Palestine. I mean, of course, there were these pockets of of PA control in the West Bank, but you you were very quickly you know these the sort of different geographies of control in the West Bank. You would very quickly be reminded of the presence of the occupation not just on the borders, inside. And of course that, ha that was true in Gaza for, for um, 
for a long period of time as well because there were settlers there, but there just there weren't as many, and there was l a larger area where Palestinian Authority controlled. This is not directly responsive to your question, but just trying to sort of what was going on at the time. Um, but by the late 1990s, people were the sort of bloom of Oslo had kind of faded. Like, you know, the real hope that this was going to lead um, w with any kind of um, speed to an independent Palestine that, that people's lives were going to be d directly improved by, you know, all, all of the hopes that the sort of 1993 signing um, had led to, and there was a, a great deal of hope in, uh, um, among the Palestinian population in the West Bank and Gaza by 98 and 99, which is when I was there for a couple of years, that was gone, that was, that was much diminished, and people were very frustrated with the Palestinian Authority, which it was basically Fatah, you know, um, because of both because of their their sense of kind of corruption within the authority, and there was a great deal of frustration actually. This was both in the West Bank and Gaza, but I think in some ways it was m almost more acute in Gaza with people that were called the returnees. So the PLO leadership that had lived outside for decades that had not participated in the Intifada. That had, and, and in the view of people on the ground, it was the Intifada that had made, that had brought, made this possible. It had made it possible for, the, for there to be any kind of concession to them. And then these people came back and took the top leadership positions. Um, and, you know, Abu Mazen had this enormous house in Gaza City, which you know, sort of stood out on the landscape for people. So there was frustration, kind of an internal domestic frustration. And there was also a great deal of frustration with what had emerged, um, what had developed on the, on the sort of politics of negotiation with Israel, that, there, that things were not moving forward to an independent Palestine. When I was there already, the sort of deadlines were, you know, swooshing past of when, you know, final status was supposed to happen, all of these things were supposed to happen. Um, and people's, for, for many people, their economic conditions had, d had diminished. So they, they were free to move within Gaza. And that wasn't insignificant to people, right? That you know, when, when um, and, until also there was a curfew every night in, in, in Gaza. So people couldn't kind of just go out and about and live their, their daily lives with ease. And also change that, and that matters. But what it also did was ma made it increasingly difficult for people to work inside Israel. So people who had had economic opportunity because of that lost it. So there was a lot of frustration with that. So finally, to sort of get a little bit to your question, when I was there, almost everybody that I met, my, that may have been overstating, there was a large, my sense was that the majority of people that I knew were Hamas supporters at that point. Not necessarily, some, that, that was their natural political affiliation, right? It fit their worldview, for, fit their religious view. For a lot of people, it was a, it was a means of critique of, of the existing power. The same way we make our political decisions, partly by what fits us and partly by what we want to oppose. And people w w wanted to oppose the Palestinian Authority. Now, again, Gaza uh, had a different dynamic than the West Bank, but there wasn't um, I mean, the world, so factional, factionalism has mattered for a long time to Palestinians. People are, are attached to their political identities, right? So it's, as an identity, it matters to people, and as a way of organizing people's lives. And not just Fatah Hamas. It used to be, you know, Fatah, PFLP, DFLP, back in the day when those parties mattered. That structured, you know, how, you know, lay universities and labor structured people's lives, but it wasn't a, bar a barrier, it wasn't a barrier to relationships between people. So, so I certainly would say at the, that time, people had their affiliations. Again, I saw a lot of support for Hamas, but it wasn't like, you know, if somebody was a Hamas supporter and somebody else was a Fatah supporter, that that was, um, it was less of a barrier than Democratic Republican in the U.S. right now. That, I think, has changed. <laughs> Uh, no, basic, basically no. It's very difficult to get access uh, to Gaza. Um, and that began, uh, for foreigners, that began essentially in the middle of the second intifada. Israel began um, constraining opportunities for people to get in. And so to, for foreigners to have access to Gaza, the, I mean, the, the basically reporters, humanitarian workers, UN of other, you know, you have to, you have to, you have to coordinate with the Israelis, and you're supposed to be on one of these 
one of these lists. Um, so it's very difficult to get, you know, sometimes people can find a way, but it's very difficult to get the kind of, especially for ethnographic research, um, where you want extended kind of unimpeded access, it's very, it's very difficult to do. So I, I, have, I have been doing field work um, in Lebanon, Jordan, and the West Bank um, in recent years, because that's where it's more possible. Yeah, well, I don't, I really don't know what the future will be, um, but I don't think, um, I suspect that what we will find out is that people are going to live in unlivable conditions. And, well, they're, you know, in some ways, I mean, I don't think people will starve because they, the, you know, hum humanitarian aid will, will be provided. Um, I suspect, I mean, what, you know, chronic medical conditions. I mean, there, I think that there, there are other kinds of effects of the unlivability. I don't think it's going to be, I would be surprised if it was starvation, if there was a cutting off of food aid. Um, but, yeah. The, the issue of water. The aquifer is colonizing. Even now, people living in Lake Street are from basically salt water. Yeah. So there's no water. Uh, that, that's the reason for the four-year projection, is that by then, the aquifer will be completely mm -hmm. colonized. There's no uh, decolonization plans in France. I have no prospects of one. So um, food, you know, you can live without food for a while. Water is free day. But people will, this is the thing about, I mean, this isn't an answer, but, you know, the, it is always kept from being, from, from, from descending into total, right? People are not going to live without food. You, you think it will be like Flint, that the UN will bring in water yeah. bottles. I, yeah, I, w I would think so. I would think so. Um, but I don't, you know, I hate, as an anthropologist, we don't like to, we don't like to predict the future because we don't, you know, but, but um, I don't, again, as I said before, I don't see anything on the horizon that's intervening to, sh to sh shift this right now. So I don't. I, I have heard, I mean, I've seen that, those reports. I don't know what that means. Yeah, I'm, I mean, I'm also not sure that UNRWA will be left to, I mean, it's, it's going to continue. I don't see it also not being in a, in a sort of continued financial crisis. Um, it's been in financial straits for a very long time. I don't see it being um, abandoned by the donors, you know, because, again, this is, uh, that, that, that's such an important part of the overall, to the extent that there is a strategy, um, maintaining humanitarian assistance is, is is a part of it, so I don't see it being just sort of left to not do anything. Um, you know, UNRWA. The question of of UNRWA's role. You know, it's it's very it's different in different places. The kind of work that it's doing um, in in Gaza because of conditions in recent years, it has sort of returned in some sense, in a lot of ways, to an earlier stage in the organization's work of providing 
rations to people. In most places, UNRWA doesn't provide any of those kinds of like daily keep you alive. It's providing services, education, primary health care, and of course it does that in Gaza too, but it has sort of returned to a more of a crisis mode. But another thing that UNRWA has done over the, the last number of years, you know, it's, it's, a, an unu it's an unusual organization in, in many ways, but it was um, found, unlike say the UNHCR, it was founded with a service mission but not a protection mission. Um, UNHCR is meant to provide protection for refugees, and UNRWA did not have that mission initially. There, there was the, the UN Conciliation Commission for Palestine, which was intended to deal with certain kinds of rights questions and resolutions, which never happened. But over the last number of years, over the last decade, really, I would say UNRWA has taken on the idea that it has a protection mission, and that's been echoed by the, the General Assembly. So it's kind of been brought into UNRWA's sense of itself. And so then there's been a lot of question, what does that mean for Palestinian refugees? What does a protection mission mean? Um, and it is, and it, and it has it's come to mean many different things, both um, sort of protecting vulnerable populations within the society. So things like um, disability rights, uh, gender violence is, is seen as part of a protection mission, but also making s claims to or trying to advocate for Palestinian human rights. So, in, and that's different in different places. In Lebanon, that may take the form of advocating for the right to work. That's been a big part of how UNRWA has seen its protection mission in, in Lebanon. In the West Bank and Gaza, that has involved both um, speaking out against settler violence against, you know, so in the West Bank, settler violence against refugees, but also speaking about the need for, the, for protection of, of Palestinian refugee civilians um, from Israeli violations of human rights. So it's doing, within its humanitarian, you know, non-political mission, mission is trying to do a work of protection, which you know, when, when once you those borders then get very messy. But that so that's one thing that that UNRWA has tr is trying struggling against the limits of its mission, the limits of its capacity, the various constraints on its ability to operate is trying to be a voice for, and that's part of what a statement like this is about is to be you know to be a voice for um, for Palestinians. Something that is, you know, uh, people have been warning it's going to end, it's going to end. Yeah. And so talking about this, and you're suggesting that we need to be more creative about solutions. Um, and I agree with you. Um, but what what is creative for you? What do you, in your conversation with people, what kinds of things that you Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah. I mean, I'm not sure I'm going to uplift, but I. But I mean, to me, it's more about uh, almost. It's more about an approach to the question. I feel like we have been locked in, and I say this not just. You know, so there's the policy community, which is locked into the two-state solution. Things can only be talked about in that way. Then there's an advocacy or an activist community, which in recent years has actually been locked into a fight about one state, two state, and where do you stand and are you for, what does it mean to be for Palestinians? Are you on this or the other? And so I sort of think we should stop talking about the form of the state. I mean, that, that's going to matter, um, but by, by making that the first, the first thing that everybody's talking about, first we need to figure out whether we need one state or two state. Um, we're, everybody is sort of immobilized. And what, there are a whole range of issues that need to be resolved rights of refugees, question of land expropriation, questions of water access, questions of what ha you know, economic opportunity, all those kinds of questions. We, if we focus our attention, I don't know how, I don't, you know, that, I don't have the solution to all of them, but, but actually focusing on the issues rather than on these forms might be a way out of the blockage that I think that both of, both of those kind of, yeah, form-focused discussions have led us in.
This is to sort of get a sense of people's understand uh, outsiders' understanding. Yeah. yeah. People in every European country start to answer in the same way. People in the United States, the majority of Americans believe that Palestinians are occupying the Israeli Mm-hmm. I suspect that American ignorance, you know, the, the, one of the privileges of being, for many people being American is not having to know anything about the rest of the world. So it's not, it's not only on this issue that <laughs> the population is less than aware. No, I agree with you very much that I think there is a there is a change, but that's a there's a change. Both the, the popular though that's in, those are the people who are paying attention. Right? You know, there's a lot of people who aren't. Okay, I'd like to conclude the public uh, part of this 